I'd like to thank you for joining us for what is the last panel of the day. We're Where really go? Um, okay. <laughs> delighted you're here and that you are sticking it out. Um, the U.S. system of detention and deportation has been growing for decades under both Democratic and Republican leadership. In fiscal year 2001, the now defunct Immigration and Naturalization Service detained 204,459 people. By fiscal year 2013, so 12 years later, the total number of people detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement had more than doubled to 440,600. This number represents more than five times the number of people entering the federal prison system for criminal offenses. Complicating the growth of immigrant detention has been the federal government's use of private corporations to administer many of these facilities, corporations such as GEO Corporation and Corrections Corporation of America. In addition to the expansion of the adult detention system, last summer we saw the return of family detention with facilities in New Mexico and Texas created to detain primarily Central American immigrant women and children. Currently, family detention facilities in Texas and Pennsylvania are st still operating and are subject to pending litigation relating to the government's compliance with the Flores settlement. With that, it is my privilege to introduce three distinguished panelists who will speak about our government's increased reliance on immigrant detention, including for families and children, as an immigration enforcement strategy. Next to me is Jonathan Ryan, the executive director of RAICES. He's sitting next to Bob, I had to double check, to Bob Leibel, who's the executive director of Grassroots Leadership. And then on the far right is Esther Olavaria, senior counsel to the Secretary, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. I am thrilled they will be here, they're here, and please check out their bios. You'll see their vast uh, um, experience on these issues. I'm going to ask them some questions, but what I'm really hoping is that we're gonna have a conversation amongst the panelists. We'll reserve plenty of time for questions and hope that we can have a conversation with you all as well, because I know there is so much experience in the audience. We'd like to take advantage of that. I'm gonna start with you, Bob. Can you please speak briefly about the history and growth of the private immigrant detention system? Sure, and thanks so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I thought I would start with a, a quote, actually. I think that we've talked a lot about policy today, a lot about statistics, and um, you know, it's important to remember that behind these policies and behind um, the statistics are people um, whose, whose stories are the reason that I do this work and the reason that my organization is involved in this. Um, and yesterday uh, at a detention center in, in uh, right outside of Austin, the Teton Hutto Detention Center uh, in Taylor, Texas, uh, uh, 28 women went on a hunger strike um, in protest of their prolonged detention. Um, and all of these women are uh, asylum-seeking women who uh, uh, are detained at this, this facility operated by Corrections Corporation of America. And this is a, from a young woman named Insis, um, who's a Garifuna woman from Honduras. Um, she said, I, I came to seek help. I suffered a lot in my country, and I'm continuing suffering with this punishment confined in this hell that is CCA in Taylor, Texas. I'm looking for help, a refuge for myself and my family, but what they gave me here was punishment. We've been treated as if we weren't human. They treat us like dogs. Um, and and her, her letter was one of 17 letters that we received from women over the weekend uh, telling us that they were going to go on hunger strike at, at Hutto um, that we published on our website. Um, um, because we do think that it is important for people to know the stories um, and the perspectives of the people um, uh, who are in these facilities, uh, that those are certainly as important or perhaps more important than, than my perspective on, uh, uh, on these issues. Um, uh, Tidon Hutto, um, uh, the, the, the person for which the Tidon Hutto Detention Center is named for, uh, was a founder of Corrections Corporation of America. Um, uh, and so his, his sort of story is intricately linked um, to uh, the founding of Corrections Corporation of America and the modern private prison industry, which is also um, very intricately tied to the growth of the immigration detention system in the United States. Uh, both Corrections Corporation of America and the GEO Group, uh, which was formerly known as Wackenhut Corrections Corporation, 
Um, both of these companies' first facilities uh, were immigration detention facilities. Uh, the very first uh, private prison, uh, and sort of modern private prison as we think of it, uh, was uh, opened in 1984 in Houston. Um, it was it's still known as the Houston Processing Center. At the time, it was located in an old motel uh, near the airport in Houston, and now it's a sort of more structured facility. Um, and it was built on a model that T. Don Hutto himself said that you could sell prisons just like you were selling anything else, just like real estate or hamburgers. Um, and so it's from these sort of humble beginnings that arose uh, a for-profit uh, detention and prison system that is now a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, CCA and Geo Group are both publicly traded corporations uh, uh, that combined have, a, have annual revenues of more than three billion dollars. Um, and spend millions of dollars every year uh, on campaign contributions and lobbying uh, expenditures to ensure that their interests are met. Um, and that certainly, uh, the federal contracts are incredibly important to the private prison industry's growth, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, and we documented in a report that we released in April called Payoff, How Congress Ensures Private Prison Profit with an Immigrant Detention Quota. Uh, that 62 percent of all uh, immigration detention beds are now operated by for-profit prison corporations. Um, that's up from 49 percent when the immigration detention quota uh, went into effect. Um, and that nine of the ten largest immigration detention facilities are operated by private prison corporations, and eight of those ten are operated by just GEO and CCA. Um, the industry spends millions of dollars on lobbying and campaign contributions, and what our report found is that the vast majority of those lobbying expenditures go towards influencing the appropriators that have written the immigration detention bed quota into law. Um, and, the, and, and all of this and all of our research was done before uh, the onset of the sort of new wave of mass family detention that we've seen at uh, Carnes and at Dilly, um, which have substantially increased the, the sort of uh, scope by which the, the, the private prison corporations have uh, in the immigration detention uh, system. So all that's to say is that these are very important players when it comes to our immigration detention system, and I think that that, that, that privatization, that contracting out of the vast majority of our immigration detention uh, system has some really uh, uh, important implications that I think we'll talk a little bit more about today. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob mentioned the bed mandate. So in 2007, Congress established through appropriations the detention bed mandate or quota which requires U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, to hold an average of roughly 34,000 individuals in detention on a daily basis. Um, currently, no other federal law enforcement agency is subject to a statutory quota on the number of individuals that must be held in detention. So Esther, can you speak to us about how the bed mandate has affected DHS's approach to detention and removal? Well, uh, let me start by saying that um, the department's interpretation of the bed, bed, bed mandate, sorry here, <laughs> the department's interpretation of the bed mandate um, is that it requires that there be 34,000 beds available, not 34,000 beds filled on a given day. Um, as you pointed out, and it's something that the Secretary has said, um, and others in the Department have said over and over, um, this is the only law enforcement agency where um, such a mandate exists and such an interpretation by others um, that these beds be filled um, has been espoused. Um, the position of the department is that um, as a law enforcement agency, we need to decide on a case-by-case -case basis who is subject to, to detention. As you know, the immigration laws require that um, mandate mandatory detention for large segments of the, of the population um, um, that are apprehended either in the interior or coming in illegally. Um, individuals convicted of crimes, um, persons subject to mandatory detention. Um, and, um, and based on, on the law and, and enforcement policies and so forth, the department should be free to, de um, to s determine who should fill those beds and, and um, shouldn't, this shouldn't be a mandate from the Congress. Esther, is that bed mandate, the interpretation, a shift with this administration? Um, I do not. Um, yes, I believe it is a shift um, from, from the Bush administration. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan, 
Uh, Bob mentioned also the return of family detention. Um, can you talk a little bit about the growth of family detention? How do we get to this point and what are you seeing on the ground? That's right. I think a lot of people were surprised when they heard in uh, July and August of 2014 that the government was going to be relying on detention as actually a means of deterrence to prevent refugees from availing themselves of our asylum laws here in the United States. Uh, in Texas uh, in 2007, the, in 2006, the Bush administration had initially uh, experimented with family detention uh, uh, at the T. Don Hutto facility, of which uh, Bob makes reference. And uh, the Obama administration, when it came uh, uh, into office, actually uh, uh, did not close it, um, but it, 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 well, it, it converted it into a, uh, an all-women's detention center. But they maintained the facility at, in Berks, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, uh, in many ways, it was this um, kind of uh, graham cracker trail of family detention that was remained that allowed the government uh, last year in response to the so-called crisis uh, at the border, uh, which I think has been tempered m majorly by what we are hearing about in Europe. Uh, our country uh, had a panic attack because 60-some thousand children uh, needed our help. Um, I read a news report on the plane over here that 83,000 people crossed into Slovenia last week. Um, yet we uh, 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 decided and determined that uh, uh, as a nation we were going to deter refugees from trying to come to our country. And so uh, the Obama administration, I think in a moment of political expedience and uh, a, a little bit of a failure of preparation for something that was seen coming down the pipe. Uh, uh, I run a small nonprofit in Texas and I was told by the government as early as September of 2013 that they were expecting 60 thousand children that coming year. Um, but um, what did the government do immediately after telling me that? They shut down for a month. And uh, uh, then uh, you know, the, uh, the shelter system, returning a little bit to the unaccompanied minors discussion, because they're very intertwined, these two populations. Uh, to be clear, many of these uh, so-called families are young women. Uh, with their young children. There are no men in these facilities. If a mother and father and child are apprehended at the border together, the father is taken to a prison for men, and then the women and children are taken to the so-called family detention, uh, family residential centers. Um, but in, in the summer of 2014, uh, when the Obama administration was facing a midterm election, was attempting to propose its uh, executive action, uh, there was the inconvenient arrival of these refugees to the border. And therefore, the response of the administration was to convert the existing Carnes detention center to a family residential center uh, after having converted a border patrol training ground into the Artesia uh, uh, detention center for families. And they relied on for-profit uh, uh, prison companies to run those, to manage those. As an, and as Bob mentioned, uh, freedom is now a saleable item. It is now a commodity. It can be vended here in the United States. And these detention centers are their vendors of detention. And when you put a price tag on that person's freedom, you essentially create a market that requires people to be detained in order to continue. And so you had a, 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 a parallel um, interest here between the government that was looking to make this issue of refugees go away as quickly as possible and a private industry that was looking to take people into its, into its detention as very much as possible. And the result was this expansion, really not a beginning, but an expansion of family detention in order to uh, 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 treat these uh, uh, refugees as people who who were not welcome in this country. And when the government did choose deterrence at its, as its mechanism, we had very many models at our disposal. We could have taken the refugee resettlement model or perhaps a disaster response model. But our government selected the enforcement and detention model. And, and this limits the toolkit with which you're going to work. It, it decides and determines the language that you're going to use, the funding streams, and how they're going to be used. And the result was a massive expansion of detention that now has resulted in full 10% of our detained immigrant population being young babies and their, their young mothers. Um, uh, uh, I could go on and on uh, uh, about that. Um, 
but um, the net result has been an entrenched policy now um, uh, from which the administration is unable to to retract itself um, either because of um, the the politics that are at play um, or because of the money interests that have now kind of taken over and and, and are themselves propelling this this policy forward thank you um, Jonathan and Bob you've both spoken about the privatization, of course, of the industry, and how that's impacting perhaps the numbers of people or encouraging an increase in the numbers of people, because that turns into money. But I would like you to respond to what it means to the people on the ground. And we've heard earlier today from Maria Elena, we heard it on the last panel, and we heard it with Bob's quote, we're talking about human beings. So to be crass, do we care who's doing the detaining if people are being detained, whether it's government versus private? And any of you, please. I mean, I, I would say I would say yes. Um, uh, we, uh, when you have the profit motive at play, uh, we all know what motivations are going to uh, uh, what, are, what are going to drive the activities. Um, these are corporations that uh, owe a, a duty to their stockholders, to shareholders, to maximize profits. And so the process is one through which the uh, private prison companies uh, uh, sell, you know, to a certain extent, this idea of detention to our government for a price. Um, these facilities c charge the government, i.e., every one of us here, up to $350 a day for each woman and child who is in these facilities. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I've never stayed in a hotel where I have paid $350, but I could tell you I would expect a lot more if I were <laughs> to pay that amount of money. Um, uh, to be clear, these are facilities uh, uh, in which women and children are uh, not afforded any First Amendment rights, in which anyone who speaks up and tries to advocate for herself or her child or medical treatment can be placed in an isolation cell where you have a metal bed that is bolted to a wall, you have an open toilet in the corner of the room where a mother and child must sit, sometimes with no lights, for hours, most of the day. Uh, you can imagine the discomfort of being a boy, potentially as old as 13 or 14 years old, who is incarcerated in a cell, and even though they call it a residential center, I have seen the paperwork, the company calls them cells, it's on the paper, uh, uh, with an open toilet with your mom for three days. Um, the effect of this, and I think Bob is right to begin with the idea that these are people, is the, is, is, is the, the attack on the most critical relationship that we have as human beings in development, which is the relationship between the child and the mother. And by completely rendering the mothers of themselves like children, all of them are passive agents in this box being told what to do, when to eat, no, you can't give your kid food now. No, you can't let your child go out now. You know, what are the children learning? The mother has no control over that. You're essentially destroying that fundamental relationship. And it is the kind of thing that will have lasting consequences, not just to these children, but to us as a nation. Because as has been spoken of before, these are children who are going to grow up and most likely become Americans. And we are sowing the seeds of a certain destruction in what we're doing now. Bob or Esther, did you want to add anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, have, I completely agree with Jonathan, right? Um, and I think that there are there are fundamental reasons why uh, we shouldn't turn over, particularly a huge portion of our immigration detention system to for-profit prison corporations. Um, uh, I think there's operational reasons, right? The model that uh, private prison corporations uh, function on is not one by which uh, uh, outcomes are incentivized, right? It is one where filling beds is incentivized and the way that profit is generated is by ex basically extracting profit from the facility. So getting paid, right, a, a per diem rate and then spending less of it on uh, the operation of the facility. Um, it's because I pays so much for the family detention facilities this is a little bit less of an issue but the you know in a correctional setting in Texas we've had uh, in in state prisons in Texas we've had uh, private prisons with 90% annual turnover rates 
right? Because the, the, the pay tends to be worse than public facilities. And it's very hard to operate any sort of uh, volatile facility, uh, any sort of organization, right, on a 90% annual turnover rate, but particularly something as volatile as a prison or a detention facility. Um, I think another reason is transparency and accountability, right? Um, uh, we have seen uh, basically the can kick down the road when it comes to accountability in many of these facilities. Uh, uh, the, uh, Mary Small from Detention Watch Network referenced a report that DWN and NIJC just put out um, that I think is a really important one for folks to read um, about uh, inspections, right, and, and the lack of sort of independent inspection in these facilities. Um, in addition to inspections, even the process for commenting on when one of these facilities is going to be open is very difficult because ICE generally uses intergovernmental service agreements to uh, contract for these facilities. So basically contracting from DHS to a local government agency and then to the private prison corporation, sort of further obscuring who's accountable to whom. And the, the most egregious example of this is in the rush to open the Dilly detention camp, the family detention center in Dilly, Texas, um, ICE uh, went out of their way to uh, uh, amend an existing intergovernmental service agreement with Eloy, Arizona, and then uh, Eloy, Arizona subcontracted with CCA to open the detention facility in Dilly, Texas, which is 700 miles away from uh, Eloy, Arizona. Uh, folks from Eloy never even visited Dilly before it, the facility was open, yet folks in Eloy, Arizona are ostensibly legally uh, and uh, responsible for what goes on in the Dilly Detention Center based on ICE contracting protocols. The reason that that happened was because they knew that if they went through an actual contracting process, that would open up the, the process to public comment so that organizations like Jonathan and I's uh, would, would be able to go comment on what these facilities uh, should be like. And, and, and frankly, that's something that we've seen um, over and over again. Uh, my organization is involved in a lawsuit right now with the state of Texas um, over emergency rules uh, to license these family detention centers as child care facilities. Um, the state of Texas is, is scrambling, it would seem, to license these facilities as child care facilities and changing uh, the rules, um, the rules for comments um, and, and licensing procedures in order for the government to meet um, uh, uh, some of the requirements under the Flores uh, litigation, which is which is still ongoing. Um, you know, but, and I think that the bigger picture here on family detention is the administration came in and did the right thing in ending family detention at Hutto. Um, and I think this is going to be a legacy question for this administration. Um, are, is this administration going to go down um, as the administration that codified mass family detention in a way that we haven't seen since Japanese internment? Um, and I hope the answer is no. Esther. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we all have different roles to play. And, <laughs> and, and, and you... Play, each of you, role. yeah, no, to, to <laughs> play your role and, 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 and do what you think is right, and, and I'm not going to criticize that. Mm -hmm. um, um, what, and I'm not going to get into a debate on the merits of um, publicly run, federally run facilities versus privately run facilities. Um, I will say, though, that um, we, our door is always open to people um, to come in and talk to us. Um, about abuses, uh, mistreatment that is happening at facilities. Um, facilities where, um, for example, the detention standards that should be in place or not in place are not being adhered to. Um, the PREA um, um, regulation um, requirements are not being adhered to. So um, my door is open. My colleagues at, at DHS and, and at ICE and, and um, um, the door is always open also to talk about these issues. Um, with respect to family detention specifically, uh, yes, um, the, the administration opened up, um, again, family detention facilities um, in light of last year's um, significant increase in, in families coming across the border. Um, um, however, over the 
the last few ye um, year or so, um, Secretary has been very involved in this. He takes a very hands-on approach um, to immigration issues, and, and this is one in particular he's been very involved and recognizes the special concerns involved in detaining families, and as a result, has been making significant changes in, in how these facilities um, uh, detain families. We are, have transitioned into making them essentially processing centers uh, for individuals, um, families that are apprehended at the border, processed, and once they establish reasonable fear, credible fear, we are releasing them as quickly as possible. And we're working with the NGOs in the ground to make that happen, and I want to actually thank um, Jonathan for all his help um, this weekend um, in in um, facilitating the release of um, hundreds of families and and helping those in particular who didn't have families in the U.S. to, to find sponsorship. Um, there's a lot more work to be done, um, of course. Um, first to recognize that we have lots more work to be done with respect to access to council issues and i um, in conversations with a number of you in the room about these issues um, and, and will to continue to make changes um, and, um, and adhere to the floor's court's order. Thank you, Esther. Jonathan, I just wanted to have a brief follow-up because I do agree, and um, um, Esther herself was very available even this weekend. We were in very close com uh, communication um, um, following. This past Friday was the date upon which the uh, order that was uh, written by Judge Dolly G in uh, California Federal Court became final. Uh, and in that decision, uh, she found that the uh, family detention facilities did not meet the standards of the Flores settlement, and, and first of all, primarily primarily that the Flores settlement uh, uh, did apply. And uh, so we are now seeing the uh, government attempt to process, as, as, as was referred to, these cases within a 20-day period of time that was uh, uh, prescribed by uh, Judge Dolly G. Um, and so uh, beginning Friday, we did see uh, uh, some people being released in, 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 in somewhat larger numbers. It was a lot for us as a small nonprofit to triage you know, approximately 250 people people over the past weekend, uh, provide them housing and hospitality, hot meals, uh, connect them with their families. Uh, uh, actually, all of them did have families and had plane tickets, and so we were able to just try to transport them. Um, and, and so we have had off and on good commu uh, communications with uh, uh, DHS depending on the occasion, but I, I think that that actually touches upon one very important part of this uh, use of the for-profit prisons as the uh, uh, instrument of the uh, deterrent strategy of detention is that these entities are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. That So these ent entities are somewhat sealed off from the transparency uh, uh, that we have become accustomed to with the federal government and that we would prefer to have in, in these matters. Um, and there have been changes. Uh, when this began uh, approximately 15 months ago, um, Senior members of the Department of Homeland Security signed affidavits, put their names on declarations, calling these women and children threats to our national security. And because these women and children were threats to our national security, they had to be held in these facilities indefinitely without any opportunity for bond or any, any, uh, any ability to be released from these facilities. There are women and babies who have been in these facilities more than a year. There have been changes that have been made, but the changes that have been made have only been made under pressure. They've only been made under the pressure of a judge's order, of public pressure, of direct appeal to people in charge. They have not been made sua sponte by the government uh, because of some realization or epiphany that these people are refugees. We know that they are refugees because when we actually represent, when we can actually represent a woman, help her prepare for her case, overwhelmingly they win. The only thing that is separating these people from the title of refugees is a judge's grant of that status. But what we know about them, everything about these people's history, the reason that they came to this country, defines them as refugees. Thank you. Esther, would you speak to us about the Family Case Management Program? Kind of talk about what it is and its objectives? Well, um, let me start with um, alternatives to detention, as you know, has existed for a long, long time. Um, I think since 2002 is the, the first 
time government, um, the appropriators um, mm -hmm. funded the measure. Uh, I remember because I was working on the Hill at that time and we saw it as a huge, huge victory. Um, and, and, and it's been um, great to see how much more funding has been appropriated to alter, um, alternatives to detention. Um, it has proven to be a very effective um, uh, means um, for us um, and, and one that you will see um, used increasingly more and more. Um, there were a couple of pilot programs that were done with respect to the case management program, one r run by USCCB, I believe, and the other one run by Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. And um, there were small programs, but, but they were um, good programs, and based on that, um, we were able to secure additional funding to increase um, this case manage, family case management program. And we put out a bid. Um, unfortunately, we only had one NGO apply and a lot of um, um, privately run um, um, companies that, that have been mentioned here. And, um, and one of the privately run companies, GEO, came up with the, the lowest bid. Um, and it was, um, unfortunately, the NGO was much, much higher. I think, um, I, I don't remember the exact amount, but significantly higher um, than the GEO bid. And under contract law, we can't um, disregard that. Um, so the award um, was um, given to GEO. We have had extensive conversations with GEO since then. And they are going to take this and. Um, grant and approach it very differently. They're going to be the umbrella organization and reach out to NGOs in the five um, cities um, that are part of this program. I think it's Miami, Chicago, New York, New York, LA. D.C., and New York and L.A. New York and L.A. Um, and reach out to NGOs on the ground who have extensive experience providing legal services, providing social services, um, the myriad of services that all of you know um, individuals need. Um, and we will be monitoring that carefully. We're also in conversations with a um, number of congressional offices that have expressed concerns about um, this grant and, and talking to them about other things that can be done, uh, maybe alternative pilots that we can set up. Um, and we welcome ideas um, from, from you know, individuals in, in the audience and others um, on, on this contract and or you know, future programs. Um, and I, I just want to put one disclaimer out, as this is a conversation. And but I, I think it's a, uh, it's both perhaps to take a little bit of pressure off of Esther because I, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to you're it. You're not <laughs> here to be. You're not here to be. I, I, yeah, we're not we're not seeking to in any way attack you. But I think it's important to this conversation as well because you know being a, a, an attorney and advocate who lives and works in South Texas, you kind of get used to people saying, "Oh yeah, well Texas, you know, oh well yeah, to South Texas, a bunch of you know cowboy border patrol people running around Texas running." A muck. Um, I think it's really important as we look at this issue to remember and to remind ourselves that this is not even as much a DHS issue. This is a White House issue. This is a White House policy. This is being driven from the West Wing. And, and, and Esther and her boss are doing what, what, what the president that we elected uh, told them to do. Uh, this is the, the Obama administration's approach to immigration. Uh, uh, this is not a crazy Texas issue. Um, and, and so um, that said, um, I think that the, uh, the um, arrival now of this case management contract uh, paradigm um, and the awarding of those contracts to GEO, I think in a certain sec, uh, s uh, sense, retroactively explains a lot of what's been happening heretofore with this uh, adventure in family detention. Case management is not something that was just realized. Uh, case management is an alternative to detention. Really, I, I, I almost hate the term alternative to detention because it's detention that should be the alternative to freedom, it's detention that should be that ultimate, ultimate last resort. But for some reason, freedom is an alternative to detention. Remember that. Um, um, this is a form of, this is a, a program that has been proposed for more than a decade by nonprofits. Um, and 
it is, at the end of the day, um, I believe a cheaper, uh, uh, more humane, and right thing to do to provide services to these vulnerable populations, uh, such as the provision of attorneys uh, uh, to help prepare their cases. Um, we could provide attorneys to all of these women and children at a cheaper cost than this detention in industrial complex uh, costs us. The result of that would be that more of them would win their cases and more of them would be granted asylum and more of them would remain in the United States. So what we've seen is a, a tendency when all things are equal for the government to fund those entities whose modus operandi is the removal and return of people from this country and not in those who are helping to protect them as refugees. Um, and, and I think that that's, a, that's, a curious, that's been a curious uh, uh, um, arc of, of this. And in a way, the family detention uh, 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 experiment has effectively brought now these prison companies in league with those of us who have been uh, uh, seeking these alternatives for, again, more than a decade. And, and so you can see that what began and what was described to us as a crisis, as chaos, as, oh, what are we going to do? Uh, and, and it's interesting also how readily we ascribe all of this to the smugglers who had just a wonderful business idea, uh, this amazing new business plan to bring people up. And that's what caused this whole thing. Yet we never ascribe that same uh, uh, that same influence to the very much, much more wealthy private corporations that we work with. What interest do those corporations have uh, in the detention of these people? Um, and, and so uh, um, effectively, the nonprofits who have built this case management model have now been sidelined. And the for-profit prisons against whom we were, we were battling are now put in our place as those case managers. Um, and so it, it's been a very interesting process, but you can see that what was initially described as chaos as a crisis, if you looked at this from the corporate boardroom of GEO or CCA, has been a very well and, and, and very uh, orderly process uh, of increased profits and increased influence, uh, not just with the government sphere, but now with the nonprofit sphere. Because as, as Esther mentioned, GEO is now going to be reaching out to us in these cities and asking us if we could represent these women. They are going to present themselves as the middleman between us and our clients, as if they are the ones who are bringing us, uh, bringing those clients or bringing us to the clients. So it is a significant change in, in the way that not just the government has, has treated these individuals, but how we as nonprofits are able to provide services in a way that builds trust and in a way that does result in them winning asylum. I want to shift a little bit. The, the legal community and the community of advocates have been very happy to see different alternatives to detention or even alternative forms of detention. This new project is only in five regions. So what it, the women who are being released, the women and children who are being released from Dilly and from Carnes, from Berks, are going all over the country and they're going in much larger numbers than this contract is able to cover. Um, what about them? I mean, any suggestions, thoughts, anything, any of the three of you? What are the what are the legal? They face a very they bear a very they face a very tough road to hoe and 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 again I repeat we could have provided we could have put lawyers and we could have put services all around the country, uh, but all of the money went to detention, enforcement, and removal and interdiction. Um, and so um, for those who, who do not have access to counsel, um, for those who are unable to avail themselves of a competent and, a, and accessible uh, uh, attorney, the chances of them uh, winning asylum are, are very low. I mean, any of us who have practiced, any of us who have tried to be a pro bono coordinator or the students who are learning it knows that this is one of the most complex uh, uh, forms of law that we have. To expect a young woman who oftentimes doesn't even speak Spanish uh, as was noted, more and more of these people are coming from the mountainous regions of Guatemala where they speak other languages, mom and quiche. They have to overcome numerous barriers just to be able to go about their daily lives. Uh, to add again the burden of preparing your asylum case pro se uh, um, really puts these people in an impossible situation. And the result, of course, is going to be loads and loads of data that folks aren't winning their cases, which is then going to feed that 
that that uh, 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 that that point of view that they are not refugees simply because they're not prevailing in our legal system, which uh, uh, is is kind of fodder for uh, a, a certain anti-immigrant uh, uh, position. Mm -hmm. if, if I could add um, something to this. Um, it's very hard to get funding appropriated from the government for anything <laughs> nowadays. Um, um, funding for representation is very, very small. We saw a little bit recently based on um, changes in the law that allow some representation for children. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Jonathan, what you said is right. Um, these women need legal representation. Asylum cases are very complex. Um, and a pet peeve of mine, and I will take off my DHS hat and just, <laughs> <laughs> um, is um, that foundations haven't stepped up um, to fund legal represent representation. It is critical that they step up and fund representation for, for people um, because it's not going to come from the um, government. Um, church groups are probably maxed out. Um, the NGOs that are working on this are working on two-string budgets, and the demand for services far um, exceeds their resources. Um, this was so um, many, many years ago when I was an attorney at a nonprofit um, representing people, and the numbers have only increased. Uh, so um, my request would be to, for foundations to go back and, and look at your funding and, and see whether you can make some funding available uh, for the NGOs on the ground that are doing this important work. And I think in a way to just treat maybe to button up what exactly I think you might have been going for, um, this is still a crisis. I, I think so many people, we talk about the crisis of 2014 or the crisis of the summer of 2014. No, the crisis continues. It's evolved, it's changed, it's moved, it's, dis it's dispersed around our country, but the crisis is now in every city that anybody here is from or where your parents are living. Uh, the crisis exists, it has just moved, and it is in the small towns, it is in the rural areas. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that that's what you're getting to. There, is exi there still exists a crisis. Um, I, I would say that the main crisis is not our crisis, it is the crisis of these people, of these individuals whose lives are are, are, are broken and and um, uh, but it, it is it, it does does exist and I think that it is unfortunate that um, uh, uh, that sense has been lost that sense of urgency has definitely been lost particularly vis-a-vis -vis representation out around the country there, there continues to be a lot of focus on representation in these detention centers but as a matter of fact um, they are processing people through these uh, facilities relatively quickly now I have things to say about um, what it takes in order to process people within 20 days. Um, uh, it, it, it involves skirting of due process. It, it involves coercive tactics to get women to accept an ankle shackle in lieu of a bond. Um, it, it involves ICE putting themselves in the immigration courtrooms at the facilities, calling women over the loudspeaker to go to court and then they arrive in the courtroom and they find ice with ankle shackles at the ready. And they put them on the women and they release them. Um, it involves ICE releasing people to shelters like the one that, that my organization now runs. Uh, and when they are released, what we found recently is that they're released with their paperwork undone. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have the actual release paperwork given to them. Uh, um, it, it is quite clear uh, that this mandate of 20 days is not feasible for the government. The government is not capable uh, of processing these cases within 20 days, um, at least not without, in some respects, uh, short-circuiting or cutting corners. Bob, anything from you? Well, I mean, to the alternatives conversation, I think that a lesson from the criminal justice system is that the least restrictive alternative, right, possible is the one that should be utilized. And I and I do think, and, and so I, I think that in some ways it's laudable to expand, you know, alternatives to detention programs, but if we're not reducing the number of people who are detained, right, if we're not reducing the detained population, we're just expanding the number of people who are under some sort of, you know, uh, control of immigration. Um, and that's that's the reality of what has happened over the last five years with the expansion of alternatives to detention. And, and, I, and to Jonathan's point about it being a corporate strategy, 
it was a corporate strategy of the geo group um we one of the things that we do is we listen to the company's conference calls that they have with investors um and you know in 2010 or 2011 at the time when they were opening the Carnes facility as the sort of model for a, the new civil detention model that um uh that ice was was ice's plan at the time they also bought bi incorporated which is the maker of the ankle shackles um and an investor asked them on the call aren't you hedging both ways here right you're you're building hard detention centers and you're buying the alternatives to detention and the answer the response on the conference call was very illuminating because it was we don't see these things as in conflict right we think that there's going to be a growth in the number of people detained and a growth in the number of people that are on ankle shackles and and that's a reality that that we've seen and i think it's you know i i, I think it's very disappointing right that the that the alternatives sort of market has gone from really you know terrific organizations like lirs and 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 catholic charities and other faith organizations to be sort of co-opted by um, a company that now operates the hard detention center the ankle shake ankle shackles and the case management right sort of a wraparound services of, of full-scale uh detention and surveillance um and i think that that's a very disturbing trend um uh, and, and I think that the answer, right, is always the least restrictive alternative that is possible. And I think that if you talk to a lot of the women who are getting out of these out of the detention centers, and we talk to a lot of them, the ankle shank, the ankle shackles are a huge burden, right? The check ins at at geo offices around the country. Um, these are you know the, the women with with you know certainly there's something psychologically damaging about wearing these things, but also physically sort of uh, you know abrasive and. Um, um, you know, I, I don't think that that is the long-term answer um, uh, for t the long-term alternative to family detention can't be to have, you know, tens of thousands of people on ankle shackles. The ankle shackles are not an alternative to detention. It's an, it's another form of detention. Uh, I, I think that we might have a tendency to think, oh, great. They're out of the, they're out of the box and they're, they're, they're out and about. So great. Who cares if you've got like a little bracelet on your leg? Um, and, and we call them shackles and I'll tell you, uh, BI calls them shackles as well because we have a BI office in San Antonio. And again, we, probably see about 150 to 250 women per week uh, um, at our at our shelter and a lot of them are released with poor quality shackles the chargers don't work just imagine your own cell phone charger goes bad well these cell phone chargers go bad too so we have to bring them into the office and get the equipment replaced and the employees call them shackles um, these are hard rubber very large I mean imagine something that's four times four or five times bigger than a, a deep diving watch um, sometimes they're strapped on so hard that we've seen women with swollen feet even just hours after having got them on we had a woman just last week who was diabetic and she had her ankle monitor uh, shacked on, uh, shackled on so tightly that her foot was already swollen and she was facing an uh, airline flight to New York the next day that's a very dangerous way to travel when you've got uh, a blood circulation cut in an airplane um, they are sidelined they're like cell phones plugged into a wall they're like, like a floor lamp just plugged into the wall for hours and hours every day um, these machines speak to the women um, we had one woman who was uh, with us over this past weekend who charged up her ankle shackle and the little voice and said inside the machine just said you know uh, device charged except it said it every 30 seconds all night long it didn't stop saying it mm -hmm. They are stigmatized. They are embarrassed. They're having to go out in public and they're wearing these monitors. What does any one of us think if you see somebody walking around with an ankle monitor? Danger. Danger. This all goes into, even though legally speaking and on the, sur on the surface the deterrence strategy has been let go, uh, this all goes to deterrence. This all goes to making life so impossible for people that they just they just attrition out from the system and they give up and they leave um, uh, uh, the the ankle shackles uh, um, have I think been a, a very big step back for uh, alternatives to detention 
I would like to give Esther the final word. So I wanted to leave, as I said, we we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and conversation. So before we move to that, if you have, Esther, any thoughts on enforcement efforts, detention, or anything else you want to talk about, um, it's all yours. Um, let me let me speak briefly about uh, the point um, Jonathan just made with respect to um, ankle bracelets. Um, we're hoping that um, very soon, and it's always hard to define what soon is in the government, but hopefully soon um, we'll be providing some um, additional guidance to individuals who are released on, on um, um, ankle bracelets um, with respect to how they can go in. Um, and you know if they're complying with the reporting requirements go in and and either have them removed or modif modified to another reporting um, method um, so hopefully that will be coming soon mm -hmm. thank you good, good. okay so now we'll open it up for questions and comments as soon as we get our microphones in place again please identify yourself and your organization Hi, uh, my name is Wilfred Tungle. I'm uh, with the Hawaii Immigration Justice Center uh, from Honolulu. My uh, question is directed to both, uh, well, to all of the panel members. The uh, state of Hawaii prison system also uh, uses C CCA. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the same corporation that runs the uh, prison system in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've had numerous lawsuits uh, that were, that, that were uh, brought by members of the uh, inmates who died or were seriously wounded uh, by another inmate. There's been cases of uh, suicides. So uh, I'm just wondering, my question is uh, whether there's been any instances, given that, you know, the description you, you folks gave, pretty dismal and depressing to tell you the truth, and has there been any kind of, you know, death uh, because of the treatment that they're undergoing in these det detention facilities? And if there is, uh, could they sue, given the, you know, given the, the fact that they're not citizens and, you know, the, the standing issue and whatnot, uh, you know? Uh, we represent. Uh, we represented a woman at one of the uh, at the Carnes uh, at the Carnes Detention Center who uh, unfortunately did attempt suicide. And I've actually just received word that as recently as yesterday there was another suicide attempt at Carnes. Mm -hmm. uh, our client who attempted suicide was uh, locked into an isolation room. Um, we had attorneys and we had um, filed our representation with the court, so we were the attorney of record with this individual. Um, she was inside of the facility. We attempted to visit her, but they did not let us. Um, we made numerous attempts to go and to see her. Uh, eventually, they told us that she was gone and she'd already been deported. Um, we made contact with her back in her home country. She was indeed reported, but not having ha after having spent the entire weekend in a hotel room in San Antonio guarded by DHS officials. Uh, I don't think that that was just so that they would keep her away from her attorneys. Um, uh, but um, we did not get a chance to meet with her before she was removed. How about you, uh, Bob? Has there been any cases? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly been, um, and there are other people, and probably Mary, right after you, uh, will be able, the, there have been many, many instances of deaths in detention um, since the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And I believe the facility that has had the most incidents of deaths in detention is the Eloy Detention Center, which is the CCA facility in Arizona, um, uh, which I believe is very close to where the Hawaiian prisoners have been housed for, for many years. Yeah. Mary, do you want to add anything before you ask your question or make your comment? <laughs> as long as I still get my question. Uh, Mary Small with Detention Watch Network. Um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, not only have there been deaths in detention, um, but ones that when the Office of Detention Oversight investigated found were partially um, or completely due to medical negligence, including one at the Aurora Detention Facility in Colorado and another at the Adelanto Detention Facility in uh, California. So the answer is definitely yes, and the government concurs with that. I don't know, Esther, if you want to add anything. 
Um, no, we're we're actually have put in place a number of measures to address the, the concerns that have been raised in these tragic situations, and we'll continue to do more. And you know, we should continue to talk. Mm -hmm. Um, to change tax ever so slightly, I think it's it's great that we're talking about um, family detention and the women and children who are held there, but I think the punitive treatment of asylum seekers is certainly not limited to families mm -hmm. and has actually expanded across our entire system. And specifically, this question is for Esther. Um, since November of last year, we've been hearing increasing reports about asylum seekers who previously would have been paroled out after passing their credible fear interview to pursue their asylum cases, instead being held um, for very long periods of time um, as their cases are proceeding. We very much appreciate this administration's stance that the bed quota doesn't require that a certain number of people be detained, but note that people who control your budget do think it requires that. Mm -hmm. And so we're just <laughs> wondering what the, what the reasoning was for the change, why asylum seekers aren't being paroled out as they were before, um, and if there's any steps underway to change that. Um, I, Thank you. I was recently contacted about this. I hadn't been following that issue. And these are individuals who've established either credible fear or reasonable fear. Um, and is it in particular localities, or are you seeing it across the country? Um, to be completely candid, and I know there's lots of other folks in the room who've been tracking this, we're seeing mm -hmm. quite a lot of discrepancy between field offices. So we're seeing field offices um, where the stance actually seems to be that folks' status as recent entrants, and therefore a priority for the mm -hmm. administration, mm -hmm. somehow trumps their status as asylum seekers, mm -hmm. which is deeply concerning for many of us. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some field offices which are still honoring the parole directive and paroling okay. folks out as we were seeing, but large numbers of field offices are refusing to parole folks. Why don't we talk offline and, and just let me know which are the field offices that you're seeing this? Thank right. you. Okay. We should Oh, sure. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Tanisha Bowens McCaddy from the American Bar Association with the Commission on Immigration. Thank you so much for the panel, um, for the DHS perspective and also the perspective on the ground. Um, I just wanted to mention um, that our commission, we have a program on family detention, a panel coming up on this Tuesday at 10 a.m. at the DCAB offices, so the conversation continues. but. Um, I wanted to follow up on one of the points that Bob made about transparency and accountability. Um, our program is related to a report that we just recently issued on family detention, but um, I think a number of people in the room, we've seen challenges when once we do mount a pro bono response or any type of legal response, um, having access to the facilities and really helping the populations that are there. So one of the things that we recommended in our report is more um, more oversight, federal oversight in, at all levels of um, the detention structure, which is something that um, at the ABA we see is sort of, um, I won't say lacking, but um, could use more to ensure that the processes, the standards are being enforced. Um, so I just wanted to ask what, from I guess DHS's perspective, um, what plans or thoughts about ensuring um, more oversight and accountability throughout the process um, may be in the works. And then from the um, local perspective, any thoughts that you have or suggestions on how to make that happen effectively. Thank you. And is your question specifically with respect to access to counsel? Um, sorry, I, yeah. I added that as one of the examples yeah. of, okay. of challenges that we see. Okay. Um, people were reporting at just one example mm -hmm. of um, where we see it, it goes. Um, there's a gap in terms of what happens at the high level, at the top level should be happening, but then we're seeing other things. Other things are transpiring on the ground. With so. respect to adherence to mm -hmm. detention requirements and yes. the like. Uh -huh. yes. Um, this is something I, I have been focusing more on family detention recently, but um, what we could do is set up a meeting okay. for you to talk to the individuals at ICE that oversee more detention policies in other facilities to discuss these other issues at length. I feel like I'm not um, in a position to um, say more because it's just not something I have been following. Okay. Okay. Why don't you give me your card afterwards? I will do that. Okay. Thank you. I'm not seeking to improve detention. I'm seeking to end it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Great. Jenna Richardson Pryor, thank you so much for all your helpful information today. Director Ryan, regarding the women and or families that are detained for over one year, 
If you are permitted, will you give examples of government reasons listed as to how these long-term detainees whom you've been working with are a threat to national security? <clears throat> They've, uh, the, the presence of women and children at the border, and the, the affidavits are available, and so you can read the affidavits. I'm, I'm not sure of the individuals who signed them. It was a member of uh, one individual from ICE and I think one individual from DHS who effectively described the fact that ha if we were to provide a bond and allow any of these women and children to be released, that this would encourage and cause another wave of immigration. Um, it, it, it makes the presumption that these are people being pulled to the United States by opportunity. And it fails to take into consideration that these are people being pushed by violence and extremism from their own countries. And so uh, uh, what's, what's interesting on the legal perspective is that, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit of immigration law, but you must make an individualized determination, a case-by-case -case determination about whether an individual should be detained. At the beginning of this effort, the department decided to label all women and children across the board threats to national security, indiscriminately so. And, and so it, it's another example of the relatively indiscriminate use of this detention policy uh, uh, in order basically to, 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 to create a show. This is a spectacle. You know, we, we hear sometimes about security theater at the airport. Well, this is another form of that theater. Um, we are being made to see that uh, the government is, uh, 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 is detaining these people. And it's in order for these people to, to suffer, to make phone calls back home, and say, don't come. It's horrible when you get here. Okay, thank you. If, if I may add, um, regardless of how we got there, we have discontinued um, invoking general deten um, deterrence as a factor in um, making uh, release determinations, bond determinations. And this happened, I think, um, sometime in May. As a result of a lawsuit. Right. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> Again? I-L-R-I. I-L-I-R-I, I believe, was the suit in New York. I-R-L-I, thank you. I'm thinking L-A-R-S. Uh, hi, Gabriella Geller with the American Jewish Committee. Um, I used to work for an immigration nonprofit, and I know that we've been talking a lot today about vulnerable populations being women and children, which, of course, I completely agree. And I'd also like to talk about uh, the LGBTQ population and how that's been being addressed in, uh, in the detention system. Um, so I, we had two clients, both transgender women being detained at the same facility and one was being detained with the men and one with the women. And when uh, the client being held with the men found out that there was another transgender woman, she asked, um, there was an ICE officer there, she asked and the ICE officer said, well, because she's more of a woman than you. So I'm wondering, you know, what sort of conversations are being had at DHS regarding policies that need to be created uh, to ensure that this vulnerable population is being treated fairly and, and humanely. Um, maybe alternatives to attention, but if they are subject to mandatory detention, then what can you do to, to ensure that besides just having the one Santa Ana LGBTQ center in, in California, which I think a lot of people would say is not really sufficient. Um, and then also to train officials working at the detention centers and ICE officials in, in interacting with this population. Um, a, a colleague of mine at DHS has actually been very involved in this issue and has been having quite a number of conversations with NGOs, with advocates around the country on this issue, and, and then with um, her colleagues at ICE. Um, there were a number of changes that were made recently. Um, you know, it doesn't stop there. We'll continue talking and um, about how to address this problem. And I, I'm not sure if the guidance that was issued is public or not. If it's public, I'll get you a copy of it. Okay. okay. It's public. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, uh, Alyssa Wickham with Law360. It's a legal news website. Um, my question is for Esther. Uh, on the deadline of the day when the families were supposed to be released last week, um, there was noise from several advocates that work in the detention centers that um, a lot of families that had been held for 20 days were still being held, uh, which was not in compliance with the judge's order. So I was just hoping for a bit of clarity from you. Um, if you could confirm that all families that should be released had indeed been released, even though, uh, as Jonathan pointed out, there 
might be some problems with that 20 day uh, release deadline. Um, unfortunately, because we are in the process of uh, a lawsuit and, and litigation, I can't speak to specifics um, and decision making with respect to these issues. So. Um, we're gonna have to leave it at that. Okay, mm -hmm. and for you, you two who work in these centers, um, do you think that there are still people in the detention centers that shouldn't be uh, you know, in non-compliance with Judge G's order? I don't think so, I know so. Um, uh, surveying the women um, just uh, that we saw this past weekend, uh, a majority of them, all of them had been there for 27 days. Uh, that was the most uh, common response. And that's 27 days after having spent usually three days in the Yelera, what they call the icebox or the Yelera, and then a two or three additional days in the dog pound or el, la, la perrera, what they call. Um, and, and this is something we haven't spoken very much about is that the, the pre-detention of these, of these vulnerable populations um, where we've seen uh, pregnant women uh, held in the same uh, reporting having been held in the same ice boxes as children with um, with zoster with, um, with 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 chickenpox virus and if a pregnant woman were to come in contact with that virus that could cause birth defects um, and so um, uh, uh, we know that they are uh, trying to uh, uh, adjust the length of stay numbers in any way possible the use of the ankle monitors the place of themselves as the court and use of ankle monitors is one way. Releasing people, uh, I presume, before their paperwork is even done is another way. Uh, we saw some women who um, I think reported that they were taken directly from the Yelera to the facility and then released. And in this way, they're racking up a bunch of zero days to be able to lower that average length of stay across the facility. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a metric game. Gotcha. Right. Thank you. The only other thing I would add to that is that the other aspect of compliance with Flores, as I understand it, is the licensing of the facilities, yes. right? Which is still a, a, the facilities are still not licensed um, and that there is still a debate in the state of Texas about even the process for licensing in them. And in Pennsylvania as well. Yeah, I, they, somebody, why don't you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> You're the geo guy. Um, yeah, so well, we, we, were, we were heartened that uh, last week it appears that the, 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 the Berks, uh, Pennsylvania Family Detention Center uh, is licensed. And um, the licensing board in Pennsylvania, I believe last week, last Thursday, made a decision to, to terminate that license. So that's oh, one. They, they said they would not renew they it. They would not in fact, renew it. it I don't know where I'm going. I think I was over here. Hi, I'm Claudia Schwartz. Um, I'm with USCIS, but I'm asking this question in my personal capacity. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are practitioners um, along the border, um, you talked about the um, effectiveness of representation in getting um, basically grants for um, claims brought before the court. Um, and then you spoke about um, how now these cases are being released and, and moving around the country. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, the basis for the claim. I know this panel is not about that in particular, but where you see the landscape there changing. Um, and, uh, you know, because some of those immigration decisions, I assume, you know, are grants at the IJ level and are not published, um, how you see that sort of opportunity for molding the law changing in the future? Um, I, I guess on the legal perspective, um, I, I think it's very interesting that the um, arrival or the expansion of family detention coincided with the precedent decision of, of, of ARCG that finally enshrined uh, uh, domestic violence uh, or, you know, in that case, uh, Guata Guatemalan married women who are, or Guatemalan women who are unable to leave a violent marriage is finally accepted as a particular social group. I find it very interesting and, coincid that, that, and coincidental that family detention, I e detention of women fleeing domestic violence usually uh, 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 came about at that exact same time. Um, the kinds of claims that we see are varied, and of course, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but of course, domestic violence is pretty rampant in these countries and not very well controlled by the government. So even though it's not a state actor, you still have the state kind of unable or unwilling to protect these women. Um, uh, there can be other forms of relief. Uh, a lot of people speak ill of gang-related cases, um, but uh, 
as a matter of fact, uh, I think a, a canny advocate and attorney can get in there and find uh, uh, the asylum claim. Um, uh, you have a, a host of other reasons. It may be related to gangs, but you may have family unit as your a particular social group. And there are even religious claims that are uh, um, uh, uh, arising in these matters. I mean, what, what do you see in terms of the tattoos that a lot of these gangsters wear? It's upside down crucifix. What's the name of the the, the head gangster in a given territory, El Diablo. Um, it, as, as, let's say, Honduras as an example, after the coup, you had a complete breakdown of government institutions, of civil society, and, and really, the, the churches kind of remained as one of the last dependable institutions in that country. And what did we see? We saw the gangs move their checkpoints to the churches and controlling people's movements to and from church because that became the only real legitimate counterpoint to these cartels was the churches themselves. And so you actually have an opening up of potential religious-based asylum cases as well. Yeah, Eleanor Acer from Human Rights First. Uh, there was no one online here, so I wanted, didn't want you guys to feel lonely. Uh, and then I, I let one or two people go in front of me. Um, so Esther, um, actually my colleague popped up with a quick follow-up question uh, to Mary's, so I'll incorporate hers in mine, which was, does the, uh, the priorities memo trump the parole memo for asylum seekers? We had always assumed from everything we were told it did not. Uh, but given its wording, it would be great to get that confirmation. And the second is we've had a lot of talk about everything that's been going on to try to meet the 20 days. I mean, all this extraordinary expenditure of resources, you know, overwhelming pro bono resources, the asylum office, you know, backlog now growing because of all the deployment of officers to do credible fear interviews. Isn't there a simple answer of stopping using expedited removal? It wasn't used for years uh, in the border areas. Um, it, it, it is causing such an incredible waste of resources, and it's an ordeal for these women to go through this process um, when, you know, very, very, very high proportion of them clearly have a shot at making asylum claims. So anyway, I, I would urge that and love to hear if, as you're regularly reviewing, the secretary has said this uh, process of family detention, which I can't call processing. It is detention. Um, anyway, that was my two questions. Sorry. Um, this is an issue with the, the, your first question um, with respect to whether the um, priorities memo um, trumps the, the parole memo. And my view is no. I think that um, we haven't had a full conversation um, on this issue, and that's why I wanted to get a sense of where these cases are happening, what offices, but um, and take it back and, and re-examine it, but my initial view of it was no, it hasn't, and that's what I've told others um, in the past. Um, with respect to expedited removal, I, I don't, we'll, we'll have an offline conversation about all of that. <laughs> And our very last question. Oh, I didn't expect to be the last one. Um, okay, so my name is Lee Ainsworth. I'm actually at 2L here at Georgetown, currently interning with Women's Refugee Commission, also formerly at Rayusis. Um, so my question is actually for Esther. Um, with regard to the new um, case management program with GeoCare, um, what sort of was the thought process behind the cities in which the program is going to be implemented? Um, I know that they're, um, obviously, if you look at the cities listed, they are large cities, um, but also these cities already have have very um, well-established networks for providing legal services and other social services to um, migrants. Um, when I worked at RAISIS, I was in charge of referrals for over a year and often finding legal representation for people in Tennessee, South Carolina, um, North Dakota even, was very, very difficult. So why those cities and why not rural areas where there's more need for that? Um, I, I was not involved in the decision making with respect to choice of cities. My guess would be is that um, this is where the largest numbers of women are um, ending up once they're released from detention or, or released at the border. Um, just I mean, looking at um, this information in the past, we, we do know there are huge numbers in, in Miami, huge numbers in the D.C. area, in the Chicago area, in L.A. area. So I'm, I'm guessing that's um, how, um, why those decisions are made. I you know, completely agree with you that there is desperate need for representation in, in what have been traditionally, um, I guess, non 
uh, well, states where immigrants hadn't settled, refugees hadn't settled in the past. So it's definitely something we should look at in any next round of um, grants. Great. Please, up real fast. Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to, but just based off of that question. My name's Jenny Hayes, I'm from Florida. Um, with Nazarene Centro de Refugio, we had a shelter for unaccompanied children. We we're not for profit. We were just we came together to meet a need, and that's what we did uh, with the urgent, compelling grant. My question was really quick, and it was on the case management model with geo in between. So, what is the the reasoning for that? Um, there are like like she was saying, there's already well established organization that. That threw up some red flags with me, mm -hmm. as far as my experience, mm -hmm. to have an, a for-profit, really basically, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but are they profiting by the people seeking asylum mm -hmm. as well as the not-for-profit group? I don't know the ins and outs of the contract, and I can't answer <laughs> what GEO's profit margin is, if any, on all of this, but um, uh, the way that my understanding the way that this would work is that GEO would be the umbrella organization and would um, contract with NGOs, for example, in Miami, um, reaching out to different NGOs that are providing legal services and other social services would subcontract with these organizations. So grants would be available through subcontracts to, to NGOs on the ground. Okay. So now please join me in thanking these great 